to commence on Monday, June 17. Also ahead this evening, Ghana and Ivory Coast agree in principle not to sell a ton of cocoa below $2,600. And in business tonight, 13 microfinance institutions whose licenses have been revoked to petition the Bank of Ghana. On the international front this evening, five-year-old boy in Uganda dies from Ebola. Stay with us here on News 360 for the details of these and much more news. As always, our bulletin is live all across the world on our website, 3news.com, as well as on Facebook. It's TV3 Ghana. Remember, we're live on DSTV Channel 279 as well. Join us with your thoughts. Now, to our first story this evening, Minority Spokesperson on Foreign Affairs and Interior. Uh, both asking government to admit a breakdown of the country's security and call for foreign assistance to help rescue the three kidnapped Takwadi girls. We'll bring you more of that particular story as we go on uh, in the bulletin, especially because of uh, reactions indeed coming through after the two Canadian nationals were rescued at the end of the day. Now, the Electoral Commission has announced its limited registration exercise for the district assembly elections. They say will commence on Monday, June 17th this year. The limited registration exercise would commence or come off after an earlier postponement when an interlocutory injunction was placed on the Electoral Commission. But according to a media release from the Electoral Commission, the limited registration exercise will come off next week, Monday, after the court threw out the motion to have the Electoral Commission restrained. The Electoral Commission says the limited exercise will take place in all district offices of the Commission and designated electoral areas or centres. Registration will start from 7 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock in the evening. Prospective applicants are to provide proof of eligibility with either a driver's licence, Ghanaian passport, national identification card or an old non-biometric voter's ID card. The exercise will run through from Monday, June 17, to Sunday, June 7, 27, this year. In some other news tonight, the Judici Judicial Committee of the Greater Accra Regional House of Chiefs has restrained all parties involved in the Ga Mancha chieftaincy matters from playing an active role in connection with the Homoa Festival, which began on June 11. A statement by the Greater Accra Regional House of Chiefs said, until June 26, 2019, when the Judicial Committee will reassemble and give further directions, all parties involved in the chieftaincy issue should not involve themselves in any traditional role in connection with the Homoa Festival. Uh, getting to some more stories as Ghana will provide free technical assistance to the Cooperative Republic of Guyana following uh, the discovery of considerable deposits of oil and gas resources offshore. President Kofuado made this known at a state luncheon held in his honor as part of his official visit to Guyana. Since 2018, there have been several high-impact discoveries of conventional oil and gas in Guyana, with the U.S. oil giant ExxonMobil in February 2019 making its 11th and 12th discoveries. President Ekufado, who received the Order of Excellence of Guyana, the highest national award, told his Guyanese counterpart, President David Granger, that the two countries should explore promptly the possibility of establishing a joint vehicle to assist in the effective initial management of oil and gas revenues. With our experiences, I believe Ghana is well equipped to share with you the do's and, the do's and don'ts in the area and make available fee-free quality technical assistance to you. Hopefully, the proper management of the new resort revenues will help finance the spectacular development of Guyana. 
The two countries since the advent of diplomatic relations in 1979 have not done much to create the relevant legal framework for the conduct of their bilateral cooperation. Our two countries are bonded by common blood, common geography, common history, and common time. This imposes on us the necessity to work together, with each one being the other's key. We look forward to welcoming all of you from the diaspora and the continent of Ghana in this year of return. President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, David Arthur Granga, said his country was pleased to honor President Ikufado for his dedication and commitment to the Commonwealth, the African Union, ECOWAS, and for his unflinching support for the rights of developing states. Now, Ghana and Ivory Coast have suspended the sale of cocoa beans for 2020 and 2021 crop season. The decision by both countries, according to the chief executive of Cocoa Board, Joseph Bwahine Edu, is to allow the international buyers to pay $2,600 per ton to cocoa farmers. The two countries agreed to the suspension after realizing that smallholder farmers are not earning much. They again identified that farmers have been over the years deprived of a living wage. With the suspension, the international community is expected to pay a floor price of $2,600 to the farmers. If it is 2599 even missing $1, the buyer must add. That's the essence. Until the buyer asks that, you know, until he tops that one dollar we are not going to sell is simplicity until the 20 20 20 21 price hits two thousand six hundred dollars per ton we are not selling however there are issues about revenue shortfall and when the two countries will resume sales after the suspension but the ceo says both countries will not lose and by July 3, a technical committee will indicate when it will resume. Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, we do four sales because uh, anytime the price of cocoa is good, then you tend to sell some of your cocoa ahead of time, even before uh, the cocoa trees flower. And that's what we do. And that's what we have seen. We've suspended that because process was ongoing to sell those uh, you know, volumes, but we've suspended everything. Meanwhile, both countries have agreed to control the production of cocoa and also improve on consumption on the African continent. We can address the question of sugar. It means it will stimulate consumption even in these conventional markets. Africa, we don't consume chocolate. Here in Ghana, the whole total consumption of Africa is 4% of global consumption. Here in Ghana, our per capita consumption is 0.5. Whereas Germany, in Holland, and others, you talk about 8 kilo. Ours is 0.5. So we, let's look at the consumption side. In a related development, the two countries have agreed to develop a roadmap to tackle child labor in the cocoa sector. Let's go to uh, one of our topical stories. This evening, where government has refuted claims Canadian security experts collaborated with the Ghana Police Service to rescue the two Canadian girls who were kidnapped at Ahojo and Kumasi in the Ashanti region. At a news conference in Accra, Information Minister Kojo Ponkroma admitted the Canadians were in town to ascertain how they could help local security authorities or operators, but to the rescue of the victims, but was quick to add it was unnecessary since the local security operatives were already on the ground. No ransom was discussed or paid. Information Minister Kojo Ponkruma maintained the rescue operation was conducted solely by the CID, BNI and SWAT of the National Security and Defense Intelligence. No foreign assets were involved in the operation. I repeat, no foreign assets were involved in the operation. Now, since the day of the abduction of these two women, security operatives have been working their contacts with the hope of rescuing them. Intelligence gathering efforts enabled the security agencies to zero in on persons who were associated with the incident. 
At 1900 hours on June 11, 2019, the first arrest was made in connection with this incident. According to the Information Minister, the holding place of the victims at Kenyasi, India Shanti region, was surrounded before 5 a.m. Wednesday morning by the SWAT team. By 5.15 a.m., the joint team had breached the premises with the hope of rescuing the women. Gunshots were fired from within the premises, but the brief we have is that it took about 25 minutes to complete this operation. At the end of the operation, the two Nigerians who were holding the women had been subdued, and currently, five Ghanaians and three Nigerians are in custody for this incident. The victims have been airlifted to Accra and under medical evaluation. Other investigations and possible arrests are still ongoing. The victims are currently in Accra. They have been in contact with the Canadian authorities and are undergoing the necessary evaluations following a traumatic incident like this. Preliminary indications that we have is that they are fine. Kojo Ponkruma urged the media and commentators as well as the public to avoid speculation. Bailey Jordan Chiti, 20, and Lorraine Patricia Catherine Tille, 19, were forced into a taxi cab on June 4 at Ahonjo. Well, let's stay on this issue further as minority spokespersons on foreign affairs and interior are both asking governments to admit a breakdown of the country's security and call for foreign assistance to rescue the kidnapped Takrate girls. Two Canadian ladies who were kidnapped last week in Kumasi were rescued by the police at dawn on Wednesday. Lauren Patricia Catherine Tilly, 19, and Bailey Jordan Chitley, 20, were rescued at Sawaba, a suburb of Kumasi. However, the police is yet to locate the missing Takradi girls almost a year after their abduction. We respect our security institutions. We know there are many men and women in there who are doing their best, who are sacrificing for our country. But sometimes you just have capacity issues and countries collaborate. I am disappointed that so far we have not called for external support. And when we had the opportunity with the Canadian assistance coming in, we did not broaden the scope and ask them to also help us unravel the Takradi kidnappings. Even as government insists the security situation in the country is not as being painted by some foreign missions, the minority in parliament demands that government admits its failure. If you don't feel secure and you can feel it, you don't need an information minister to come out there and say everything is all right. On a daily basis, we're experiencing highway robberies, residential robberies. Crime rate in general is on the increase. And this can be cross-checked if you, the statistics are there for all to see, statistics from the police service itself. So we are not the ones who are trying to play politics with security. You don't play politics with security. But the, 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 the reality of the matter is that the security situation now has gone from bad to worse. Uh, after the news of the release of the Canadian girls, uh, there's been a lot of demand that what's happening with the Takrade, three Takrade girls. Well, the information minister said a lot more effort is also being put in in that regard. But let me just remind you, it's almost 300 days since the first Takrade girl was kidnapped. We're keeping tabs on this. But Youth Challenge International, the organization, the two Canadian girls worked with for actually is saying that their parents have been in contact with them since their release. Lauren Patricia Catherine Tilly, that's 19-year-old, and Bailey Jordan Chitty, 20, both students working as volunteers in Ghana, were kidnapped in Kumasi on June 4. Now, the organization added the ladies have been receiving emotional and psychological support from counselors, and it added that a medical examination done on them has revealed they are both on head. Youth Challenge International also expressed its immense appreciation to the government and people of Ghana, Ghana security agencies and the Canadian government for their support.
you know, there's been some reaction whether indeed the, these girls were rescued or released. And let's just take a look at how the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, that CBC, reported this particular story when uh, an email was sent by the Canadian uh, government, that's a representation here in this country, to them. And uh, the explanation whether it was a release or a rescue. And what do we know about how they were released? Well, what we have right now is some sparse details from both the Canadian and Ghanaian governments. The Canadian government uh, confirmed their release in an email to CBC, and I can show you more of it here. They said the government is very relieved to confirm that the two Canadians who were kidnapped in Ghana have been released. We would like to thank the government of Ghana for their cooperation in the resolution of this case. And they said consular services are being provided. Now, we know, as I said, that Canadian officials were working with Ghana police with local authorities and security agencies to free the, these women. And the word that they were freed first came from Ghana's Ministry of Information this morning. I can show you more of what they said. They said national security operatives in the early hours of Wednesday, June 12th, completed an operation which successfully rescued the two Canadian women recently abducted in the Ashanti region. Now, you may notice a difference in the wording there. That statement from Ghana calls it a rescue. The Canadian government says, release that just seems to highlight how little we know about what actually took place this morning well so so this derivation has brought up a lot more questions to it whether it was a release or whether it was a rescue but then we'll, we'll be subjecting to, to self the analysis whether these two uh, positions that affect the material facts of the issue as we have it stay with us Certainly, Alfred. Let's turn to some other news this evening as residents of Bumbong and adjoining communities in the Yendi municipality of the northern region are requesting government support to get the small town water project back on track. They contend having to compete with animals for water from a dam following the breakdown of the water system last year. Here's a report by Christopher Amwako. Bumbong is along the Yendi Gushegu stretch of the Eastern Corridor Road. The predominantly farming community has a population of about 10,000. The over 200 communities in the area, with a total population of 90,000, currently rely on a dam for their portable water needs. Bumbong in 2013 benefited from a small town water project with funding from the Canadian government. The facility, however, broke down last year. Residents now have to compete with livestock for water from the dam. Look at how the water is. Look at it. We drink it. Same water we drink. We use it for cooking and other things. So we don't have any. Oh, the water body is just there for the name. There's no water flowing out of it. She appealed to government to intervene. Even we share the water with animals. Look at some of the animals over there. And they urinate and they, are, they even free themselves inside the water. So we are appealing to the government, Nana Akufuadu, to come to our aid and give us a district. If we get our own district, we can also get a portable water to drink. The chairman of the small town water project, Hamza Zindu, requested financial support to repair the water system, which broke down due to the perennial power outages in the area. It will require concrete efforts by government and other stakeholders to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 6 on clean water and sanitation. On MTN Video Report today, our citizen journalist Kwame Boating highlights the deplorable state of the OUB Ebre Road. This is the OUB to Ebre Road. Look at the deplorable state of it. We are pleading with the government to come and construct it for us. When it is done, drivers coming from Tema Harbour and Ashaman can ply it to in Sanwum, Koforidia, Kumase, and beyond. This is a citizen journalist reporting from Ebuaten. You can also send your video report via WhatsApp number 055-143-3044. Do stay with us here on News 360. We've got the latest of business news coming up shortly.
Welcome back to News 360 and to the business segment tonight. 13 microfinance institutions affected by the cleanup exercise say they are preparing to petition the Bank of Ghana for further engagement since they were given a period to clean up their books. The executive secretary of the microfinance institutions network, Yao Jinfei, who made the disclosure, said the magnitude of the number of institutions closed down has created a case of mistaken identity for the relatively solvent microfinance institutions. 137 microfinance companies remain active following the revocation of the licenses of the 347 of them. Poor corporate governance practices led to poor lending practices and high non-performing loans with the consequential capital deficits, according to the statement by the central bank. Persons entitled to claims for many of the collapsed microfinance companies have begun processes to access their funds with the completion of validation of claims by the receiver. Eric Nananipa of PricewaterhouseCoopers, Executive Director of the Microfinance Institutions Network, Yao Jemfi says the magnitude of the number of institutions closed down has created a case of mistaken identity for the relatively solvent ones, which has led to further panic withdrawals. We've come to a stage to uh, see what it entails, and then we are working on a few things to get back to the central bank cards to for some of our members who we find them in. Uh, some were given some time to work on what ABCD, and we anticipate that they are on course. So those ones, uh, why should they be part of this? Um, we are yet to receive any further things, but what we are also doing on the ground is to um, collect all this kind of um, information from the various people who have been affected. For his part, Chief Executive Officer of Delex Finance, Ken Thompson, says although the exercise has saved the depositors their funds, small businesses which depend on the sector for credit will not be spared the impact of the closure of the microfinance companies. I think of the job losses uh, that are going with it, the direct and indirect losses. In a country where unemployment is high and in a country where uh, dependency on people that are employed is very high, it makes me very sad. But even then, it's even the supplies, those that supply food, those supply paper, those supply water, all those people are affected. Then um, I'm happy for the depositors. I'm happy for the depositors uh, because hopefully they can get at least their principal back. I'm sad, really sad for um, the people, you know, our mothers in the villages, you know, who depend on some form of credit to do their business. Apart from the affected microfinance companies, 39 microcredit institutions also had their licenses revoked by the central bank. Registrar General Jemima Owari, who is the official liquidator for the collapsed microcredit institutions, says the winding up of the affected companies has commenced. Well, the year-on-year -year inflation rate for May 2019 was 9.4%. This was a marginal decrease of point one percentage point from the 9.5 percent uh, recorded in April this year. Now, the fall is attributed to decline in the inflationary rate of food and non-food items. The year-on-year -year food and non-alcoholic inflation rate for May 2019 was 7.3 percent. This is 1.1 percentage point lower than the rate of 8.4 percent recorded in April 2019. The year-on-year non-food inflation rate for May 2019 was 10.6% compared to 10.4% recorded for April. Deputy Government Statistician David Combact outlined the main price drivers. For the non-food inflation rate were recreation and culture, a rate of 15%, clothing and footwear, also a rate of 15%, furnishing, household equipment, routine maintenance, a rate of 14.5% and transport with a rate of 12.5%. The price drivers for the food group were coffee, tea and cocoa with a rate of 15.1%, fruits, a rate of 10.9%, vegetables, a rate of 8.4%. Inflation rate for imported items was 11.2%, while that of locally produced items was 8.6%. The year-on-year -year inflation rate for imported items of 11.2% was 2.6 percentage points higher than that of locally produced items, which had a rate of 8.6%.
So a 0.2 percentage drop in the case of locally produced items. At the regional level, the year-on-year -year inflation rate ranged from 8.0% for Upper East Region to 11.1% for Upper West Region. Four regions, namely Upper West, Bono Ahafo, Western, and Ashanti, recorded inflation rates above the national average of 9.4%. Ashanti region recorded the highest food inflation rate. The fact that Ashanti is recording the highest in, uh, food inflation rate does not mean that food prices are highest in Ashanti. It just compares price of food in May 2019 against price of food in Ashanti in May 2018. We are reporting only for the old regions. Uh, we have not taken the new regions on board yet. Uh, we will soon be working out. And so subsequent releases reporting on the new regions. The Consumer Price Index measures the average price of a bunch of consumer goods and services. Uh, Anglo Gold Ashanti is collaborating with the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, KNUST, to establish a university college in Obwasi. Uh, Managing Director of Anglo Gold Obwasi Mines, Eric Subonting, who made this known at the fourth Mining and Energy Summit in Accra, said the move forms part of the company's corporate social responsibility. Companies in Ghana's extractive sector are required by law to mainstream corporate social responsibility into its operations. Managing Director of Anglo Gold Ashanti, Jasper Musaid Wezwa, noted the time was right for mining firms to create lasting impacts in their operational communities. The next aspect of tertiary level is also to say there's an apprenticeship program. Whether you're an equipment operator, uh, or you're an electrician or auto mechanic, we give you that skill so that you can come and get, get employed with us. So that now we move from low level jobs where they come as casuals to cut grass and they do cleaning jobs to jobs that actually add value at a higher level. President of the Chamber of Mines, who is also managing director of Anglo Gold Abuasi Mines, Erika Subonting, revealed his outfit is collaborating with the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology to establish a university college in Abuasi. We then assessed the various tertiary institutions and said which of them can partner with us to realize that aim. And out of that, we selected KNUST to set up a university college in Obuasi. I mean, like I mentioned, we expect that by September, at the beginning of the new academic year, the programs will be rolled out. Deputy Energy Minister Dr. Amin Adams gave an assurance of government's commitment to us providing an enabling environment in the mining sector. I want to assure you that as partners in development, the government is committed to working with industry by ensuring that your businesses are safeguarded and not disrupted by unplanned energy challenges. The Bainal Mining and Energy Conference and Exhibition provided a platform for suppliers to meet with captains of the industry to strike deals and enter into strategic partnerships. The three-day conference is on the theme, harnessing mining and energy potential to accelerate national development. Well, that's it for business this evening. Remember, there's more business news on 3news.com. It's alive here on News 360. Stay with us. We're back with some more stories. Hello, good evening, and it's time for us to do sports here on News 360 with me, Thierry Nyan. Now, before every major tournament is uh, the conversation of how money is spent on the participating team. It is often said that the players are overpaid, but the Black Stars will hope to avoid the distractions that accompany these talks and rather let the football do the talking on the pitch. Honorable Curtis Perry Okujetu, Deputy Minister of Youth and Sports, makes um, or gives an interesting twist to the discussion. He says the players deserve every penny they receive. Ghana will stand behind the Black Stars during the AFCON 2019 tournament. But one quandary that still lingers in the minds of the Ghanaian fan is the amount of money dispensed to these players who represent the country in tournaments. Appearance fees, Winning bonuses and per diems are hypersensitive issues to these players. 
a budget of $7.2 million was presented to government by the Normalization Committee as total budget for the AFCON 2019. Although yet to be confirmed, there is a feeling the entire financial package that covers the Black Stars' preparation in Dubai and tournament in Egypt takes a huge fraction of what may be allocated for sports in the year. Deputy Minister of Youth and Sports, Honorable Perry Curtis Okujetu is adamant whatever money is paid to the players serve a tremendous purpose of motivating them for glory. I think that any, anybody who engages in that kind of argument wants an easy way out. The whole business of football, sports in general, yes, is about nationalism. But also, if, if you're leading such you know, a crusade where a national team represents a country in a, in a continental tournament or in a global tournament, the welfare of the team is as important as how nationalistic they are. And people say that, yes, when you play for your country, that is when you get noticed, and that is when the big bucks, or that is when you make the big bucks, yes. But in football and in sports, motivation is a key factor of how well teams do. And that is why I don't believe that we go over the top. I think that what we do is to try and be, and be human and try and negotiate with the teams, negotiate with individual players, negotiate with technical teams, and to make sure that we give them a package that will edge them on. Ghana has missed out on the Africa Cup of Nations since we last won it in 1982. Kwesi Apia and his backroom staff will hope this will be the year the trophy comes home for the fifth time. Let's stay on the Black Stars just a little while longer and the Black Stars continue to train in Dubai after the final squad uh, was named for the 2019 AFCON on Monday. Now the team is expected to intensify preparations and focus on building strong chemistry among the 23 that have been picked for the final tournament in Egypt. The team will play against South Africa on Saturday in their final pre-AFCON friendly to put finishing touches on their preparations before heading to Egypt, where the team will face Benin, Cameroon and Guinea-Bissau in the group stages of the tournament. Still in a build-up to the AFCON 2019, the final squads for the AFCON um, are being announced by the participating countries. For Senegal, there are so many familiar names, especially in attack. The likes of Sadio Mane and Mbai Diaye are among the ruthless forwards in Aliu Cisse's team. But just how fearful are the Taranga Lions? This report answers that. On paper, the Taranga Lions have the best attack at this year's African Cup of Nations tournament. The plethora of attacking options has compelled coach Aliu Sise to put seven attackers in his team. The Taranga Lions have never been a team that has suffered to find the net. Their run to the AFCON this year yielded 12 goals. Only Nigeria managed more with 14. The attacking prowess of the team is one that will strike fear into any opposing team's defender. In Sadio Mane, Senegal have a captain who has just worn the golden shoe in England's top flights and the UEFA Champions League. His 26 goals in all competitions this season is a testament of how good he can be in front of goal if the service is right. Of the seven strikers called up by Sise, Mbaye Diang, who plays in Turkey for Galatasaray, comes into the team with the most goals with 31 in all competitions. Senegal's seven strikers, including Ismail Assar and Keita Balde, scored a combined 86 league goals last season and a total of 101 in all competitions. Staggering stats, which is in sharp contrast with the Ghanaian striking lineup of Jordan Ayew, Asamoajan, Caleb Kuban, and Kwabno Wusu, who managed a total of 20 league goals together. Goals are a currency of the beautiful game, and Senegal have it in abundance. It's an early breakthrough. And that's all for the sports here on News 360 with me, Theo Nyana, return later at 9.30 p.m., bringing you some more sports on Sports Unlimited. Keep watching TV3.
Hello there, good evening. My name is Miriam Osei Ajaman. Let's settle for some entertainment news. And we start off with Naki Yathramani, seven-year-old poet and winner of Talented Kids Season 10, Naki Yathramani Sam, has been honored and appointed sanitation ambassador by the sector ministry. Her ambassadorial role is a result of her thrilling and educated performance on environmental sustainability during the competition. Into the gutter last night. You knew it was not right, but you never bothered. With a startling performance, the gifted poet got patrons and judges spellbound with her awesome presentation on the need to protect the environment, preaching cleanliness and afforestation. The young poet earned massive commendation for her mind-blowing performances at a short ceremony at the Sanitation Ministry on Tuesday, June 11. The sector minister, Cecilia Abnadapa, affirms the prodigy needs to be celebrated. It's not every child that can recite and think through and remember and see the importance of what she was, I would say, speaking out. She spoke with such conviction and such passion that I have immediately appointed her as an ambassador, our sanitation ambassador. Because she was presented with a citation for championing a positive cause and charging duty bearers to act. Yes, you are the ambassador. You understand what an ambassador is? Yeah. Everywhere you go, you talk about sanitation. You talk about the environment. To shame we the adults. <laughs> hmm? To shame us. Some of us don't care, but you care at the age of seven. The sanitation minister lauded media general for the initiative that seeks to unearth and nurture talents. Well, I, I also want to take this opportunity to thank TV3 for the initiative. This is the 10th season. And I hope you will unearth, you know, Ghanaians are so blessed with talents. So let us encourage our children to uh, bring out their best. With For the next two years, Nakia's drama Sam will embark on outreach programs on protecting the environment. Her victory is really important because it also coincides with the initiation of our sanitation campaign. The Media General Group as a whole has set out on an agenda to sensitize the public about the state of sanitation in the country. So we are happy that this time around, everything seems to have fallen in line and uh, we will stay the course. The likes of DJ Switch, who is traveling around the world and speaking out of talented kids. Uh, we've seen the likes of Samuel Ousu and now uh, the youngest ever, Nakia Dramani Sam. So it's going to repose confidence in the kids. It's going to motivate them. It's going to inspire them to want to be themselves and be what they really want to be. And that's what talented kids is all about. So definitely we're looking forward to more talent to come out of talented kids as we move on into the 11th year. And we're ever so proud of Nakia. My name is Miriam Osei Ajman. I have Techie GH to thank for my outfit and that of Natalie. There's more news on 3news.com. Have a beautiful evening. Well, they Thanks look so red. Very. You do well. as well. You have a tattoo. Yes. Do you ever read that? I want to say thank you so much. It's been amazing with you over the last 60 minutes. My name is Alfred Okansi. I'm Natalie Ford. A lot more news on our website. It's 3news.com. Thanks so much for watching and have a great evening.